Um, I've called it the man who invented Narnia. So I do want to connect up C.S. Lewis and his writings about Narnia. So here we go. I would say Lewis is one of the most unlikely children's authors you could ever come across. Uh, he was an academic all of his life and generally they don't write children's books. Uh, he taught first at Oxford and later at Cambridge. He was not married until he was over 50, so he didn't have children of his own, no nephews or nieces. He only had one brother who never married. His closest friends were all other male academics. That's Lewis on the right there. Uh, he describes himself in one of his letters to children and they're enjoyable in their own right. I am tall, fat, rather bald, red-faced, double-chinned, black-haired, have a deep voice, and wear glasses for reading. So that was his self-assessment, at least when he was describing himself uh, to children. So what made him the writer that he was, and in particular, why did he write the kind of things that he did when he was writing the Narnia stories? And I want to walk us through three aspects of Lewis's life that I think come together in what he's trying to do in the Narnia series. The first is very simply his early experience of religion. So he grew up as an Anglican in Belfast in Northern Ireland. And he says, as many of us would say about our childhood, it was taught the usual things, made to say my prayers and in due time taken to church. I naturally accepted what I was told, but I cannot remember feeling much interest in it. He actually recalls two experiences and frankly, neither of them was very good. Uh, one was they used to go to the Anglican church where his grandfather, that is his grandfather, uh, was the priest. And there were two things in particular that Lewis did not like. He disliked the fact that his grandfather's preaching was highly emotional. He would weep in the pulpit, mainly over the evils of Roman Catholicism. But as Lewis grew, he also realized that there were many people who were present there in the Anglican church for one reason alone, and that was to demonstrate to the world that they were not Roman Catholics, which was the way to get on in the world of um, Belfast in those days. So that was part of his negative influence of religion. But then when he was 10, uh, his mother died and his father decided to send Lewis and his brother to boarding school, more than one because Lewis never settled down in any of them. That's Lewis on the right. At one of them, Lewis reported the religious instruction emphasized the reality of hell. He says, I feared for my soul and clearly they didn't tell him what to do about it. At another one, he learned to pray, but he found he became obsessively introspective about whether he was doing it right. And he actually says, had I pursued the same road much further, I think I should have gone mad. Looking back later, he says this was really just the dry husks of Christianity. It wasn't the thing itself. It took him a long time to figure out what that was. And so by his early teenage years, um, he was saying, I'm desperately anxious to get rid of my religion. And by the time he's in his mid teens, uh, he considers himself an atheist and stays an atheist until he's in his early thirties. I suspect that many people in our culture, at least over the age of 40, not so much under 40, can identify with that kind of progression. Learning about Christian faith in childhood, struggling with it, asking questions, and not finding any help to transition to a more adult understanding of the faith, and finally giving up, maybe declaring themselves atheists. So that's one strand, the religious strand. But then there is a second one that runs through all of his life, at least until his conversion. Because at the same time that he was becoming disillusioned with church, on the other hand, Lewis was having experiences that he called joy, which in Lewis's writings is almost a technical term. 
He goes so, so far as to say joy is the central, sorry, the central story of my life is about nothing else. That's how important it is to him. What does he mean by it? Well, the more important something is, the more ways there are to talk about it. I find this definition very uh, intriguing. An unsatisfied desire, which is itself more desirable than any other satisfaction. So usually, you know, if, if you have an unsatisfied desire, you desire an ice cream on a hot day, you get the ice cream, that's what you desired, the desire goes away, it's no longer unsatisfied, who cares that you wanted it five minutes before if you've now got it. But he says this is a desire, it's not satisfied, but that desire is better than any other satisfaction. It's pretty strong language. He calls it a desire no natural happiness will satisfy. And that, of course, is giving you a clue as to what he figured out about joy. It's not satisfied by natural happiness. And on reflection, he realizes that joy is the work of the Holy Spirit trying to get his attention, pointing him to something beyond this physical world. And I like the phrase he uses, they are splashes of God light, those experiences, in the dark wood of our life. And of course, let's just underline, these things happen to him outside his experience of church. Now, these experiences of joy began quite early in his life. Lived in Belfast, uh, surrounded by the Castlereagh Hills. He could see them from his bedroom window, and they just um, evoked in him this feeling of joy just through their beauty. On one occasion, his brother Warney brings into the house a toy garden, a miniature garden. That brings him joy. Again, not what we generally mean by joy, but this sense of something beyond that he is longing for. And this comes to him also through literature. At least I think I can call Beatrix Potter and the Tale of Squirrel and Nutkin literature. I'm going to anyway. Uh, again, this fantasy world of, of uh, animals just drew this feeling of joy out of him. What is this? that he wants. As he becomes a teenager, Scandinavian mythology becomes very important and very powerful. He discovers this book, Siegfried and the Twilight of the Gods, and particularly its illustrations by this well-known Victorian uh, illustrator, Arthur, Arthur Rackham. And that particular form of joy he calls northernness, because it is to do with Norse mythology. Uh, yeah. As he looks back on it later, he realizes that this mythology and his love of it had really become a substitute for religion. At this time, he actually feels more reverence towards the gods he encounters in North mythology, Norse mythology than he'd ever found in church. In other words, he was having experiences that later on he was realized were actually glimpses or foretastes of experiences of God. It's just that at the time, he had no idea that that's what it was. And sadly, the church had not helped him to understand that kind of experience. Here's how he describes it. If the northernness seemed then a bigger thing than my religion, that may partly have been because my attitude to it contained elements, mysticism, awesomeness in the literal sense, which my religion ought to have contained and did not. I find sometimes Christians are very patronizing about secular people's claims to be spiritual or to have spiritual experiences. I suspect sometimes the problem is not with the experiences or the feeling for some spiritual reality, but the fact that nobody has showed them how those things might be connected to the gospel and might even be designed by God to prepare them to hear the gospel for their fulfillment. So that's the second theme. First was religion, second is uh, spirituality, and the third, I would have to say, is the development of his intellect. So Lewis absolutely hated, I think it's fair to say, every one of the boarding schools that his father sent him to. 
Well, Lewis was not into sports apart from anything else. And if you're at a private school to the British called public school, just to be difficult, um, and you're not into sports, it does create a huge uh, cultural problem. So his father eventually sent him to live and study with a private tutor, W.T. Kirkpatrick. We do not know Mrs. Kirkpatrick's name, but I suspect she was a saint. Kirkpatrick was strongly rationalistic and an atheist. His rationalism, you would know if you had the temerity to remark that what a what it was a fine day. And who say, what exactly do you mean by that? And what basis do you have for saying that? And by what comparison are you saying that? And should you have bothered to say it in the first place? That kind of rationalism. Uh, Kirkpatrick had grown up a Scottish Presbyterian. Uh, there was only one remnant left of that childhood religion. And that was when he was out in the garden, gardening on a Sunday, he wore his best suit, apparently. So Lewis lived with the Kirkpatricks in the house, studied, discussions continued over mealtimes, and Kirkpatrick taught Lewis how to think and reason and argue. And you can see Lewis, how Lewis benefits from that uh, in his later work. Lewis himself said he loved it. He'd never experienced anything right, like it, but he said for him it was red beef and strong beer. Kirkpatrick, uh, from what I've said, you might guess that he's uh, not given to flowery compliments, actually commented to C.S. Lewis's father, his reasoning capacity is beyond his years. It's probably an understatement. But as a result, when Lewis tried to get into Oxford, he had no problem about it. That's not quite true because he failed the math component of the entrance exam. But by the time the First World War, uh, he was back from the First World War, uh, that didn't matter anymore. He got in anyway, thanks be to God. So by the time he went to Oxford in 1917, he certainly had a brilliant mind, we know that, but you think of all his experiences of joy, his enjoyment of mythology, he was also very confused. And he describes that confusion like this as two hemispheres in his mind. And these two hemispheres were in sharpest contrast. On the one side, a many islanded sea of poetry and myth, all that is beautiful and meaningful. And on the other, a glib and shallow rationalism, an ability to dismantle, we would say, deconstruct any argument. So on the one hand, nearly all that I loved, I believed to be imaginary. And nearly all that I believed to be real, I thought grim and meaningless. So sad, isn't it? So how is he going to resolve these things? Now, even before he went to university, he had been influenced by two Christian writers. Uh, one was the 19th century Scottish writer, George MacDonald, whose book Fantasties uh, Lewis read as a teenager. Uh, that made him say, I knew that I had crossed a great frontier I think we could say it just opened vistas into a reality that Lewis had not sensed or suspected before. And the other one uh, was the everlasting man, G.K. Chesterton. It's interesting that Lewis, a lifelong Anglican, deeply influenced by a Presbyterian and by a Roman Catholic. I think MacDonald is a Presbyterian. Someone will correct me, I'm quite sure. Anyway, G. Chesterton is certainly a Catholic whom Lewis considered the most sensible man alive apart from his Christianity. Small detail there, but very sensible apart from that. And later on, he reflects, a young man who wishes to remain a sound atheist cannot be too careful of his reading. There are traps everywhere. And of course he fell into them. And then as for many people going to university, um, that experience also put Lewis in touch with uh, different people. And in particular, he began to make friends who, with people who were his intellectual equals. That was a new experience. Neville Coghill, he met in 1922. Hugo Dyson, 1925, both of whom I was in seminars with when I was at university. And of course, you know the other one, J.R.R. Tolkien, 
1925, he met him. But although they were very smart, Lewis was very taken aback to find that each of the three was a thoughtful and committed Christian. How was this possible? And again, later reflection, he said, the great angler played his fish and I never dreamed that the hook was in my tongue. So we come to the matter of Lewis's actual conversion. Uh, conversion we know means turning and for most people it's not a quick thing, it is a slow process, although there may be significant turning points. And uh, for Lewis it certainly was slow. There were three or four stages and took place over two or three years. The first was uh, on a bus going up Headington Hill in Oxford and no, this is not the actual bus. It's the best I could do. I was going up Headington Hill on the top of a bus. Without words, and I think almost without images, a fact about myself was somehow presented to me. I became aware that I was holding something at bay or shutting something out. I felt myself being there and then given a free choice. I could open the door or shut it out. I chose to open. I felt as if I were a man of snow at long last beginning to melt. And we know what he will make that imagery of snow melting do later on. I rather dislike the feeling. Sometimes I had students describe this as opening himself to God or to Jesus. You know what? He doesn't actually call it anything of the kind. And I think that's very significant. He just has this sense that there is something out there that he needs to open himself to, even though he doesn't name it, maybe he doesn't even know what it is. But it is a significant step along the way. Then 1929, spring. He's in his uh, rooms at Magdalen College in this, which was called the new building because it was not built until the 1700s. And he writes, you must picture me alone in that room at Magdalen night after night, feeling whenever my mind lifted even for a second from my work, the steady unrelenting approach of him whom I so earnestly desired not to meet. That which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. In the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed, perhaps that night the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. No excitement, no ecstasy, no vision. Sounds like saying someone saying, oh, I guess two plus two do make four. What a drag, I'd hoped. Or as he himself puts it, amiable agnostics will talk cheerfully about man's search for God. For me, they might as well talk about the mouse's search for a cat. Why so negative? Because he knows, he knows enough about Christian faith to know that if God is real and he messes with God, God is going to mess with him and his life will never be the same again. Just a footnote here. I've wondered why he so much stresses that it wasn't an emotional experience. And my private theory, and I can't find any way of documenting this, is it was around the time that um, when he's writing about this, not when he's having the experience, but when he's writing about it is the time when Billy Graham is beginning to do his crusades in England and being criticized in the press and indeed by some church leaders for simply appealing to people's emotions. This is not real. It will wear off. Uh, it's not going to last. And I wonder if Lewis writing it wants to emphasize the fact that for him, there was absolutely no emotion in it except fear and reluctance. So trying to say, well, there may be some for whom it's very emotional, but you know what? It's not true for everybody, but that's just my theory. Again, it's worth noticing he's not a Christian. He has come to believe in God. He is a theist. And what finally pushes him to the next step is uh, a late night conversation with his friends Tolkien and Dyson. Actually, the conversation with Dyson goes on several hours uh, after Tolkien has gone home to his wife. Uh, so you wonder actually um, who had the more influence, although Tolkien's is the better known name. 
you can still walk in this beautiful, um, this beautiful walk behind Magdalen College in Oxford. And then the heart of the conversation was that up to this point, Lewis had felt that the stories of Jesus, the God who dies and rises again, uh, was simply another form of the timeless myth that occurs in every cultures about a God who dies and rises again. And why would you have to take it seriously? It's just a beautiful story. A lie breathed through silver, he called it. But Tolkien argued, no, no, in Jesus, actually myth breaks through into real history. Of course, the mythologies of the world are hints. They are out there. They're from God. They're God pointing people in the direction of truth and reality and preparing them for the full reality of the coming of Christ which in, when you think about it is a brilliant way of applying the truth of the gospel to someone's very specialized interest, Lewis's interest in, in mythology, and who could possibly have made that connection except uh, Tolkien uh, and maybe Dyson as well. So this is a strong, even uh, an overwhelming argument. Jesus is the fulfillment of the mythology that he loved, Jesus, the God who dies and rises again, not as a nice universal story, but at a particular time and place in history, crucified under Pontius Pilate at a particular place in the Middle East. And shortly afterwards, he writes to a friend to explain this wonderful discovery. The story of Christ is simply a true myth, a myth working on us in the same way as the others, but with this tremendous difference that it really happened. It is God's myth where the others are men's myth, myths. Now you might think surely Lewis is now a Christian. According to his own account, there was one more step. And it took place a few days after this late night talk with Dyson and Tolkien. He was going uh, with his brother to Whipsnade Zoo in London. Warney was riding the motorbike, Lewis was in the sidecar no, this isn't them, but it was the only picture I could find of an, a period uh, motorbike and sidecar from right around the right period. Um, and as they were going, what Lewis actually says of that trip is when we set out, I did not believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. When we reached the zoo, I did. And again, he's emphasizing that it's not an emotional thing. It's not dramatic. But of course, it didn't have to be. This has been a long process. And there was just one piece of the jigsaw that had to be slotted into place. And it happened during that time of quiet uh, on the road. Of course, one might say in, in a motorcycle sidecar, he was probably in the fear of imminent death, which might have catalyzed that as well. But he doesn't say that. And let's note the whole conversion process had taken something over two years. For those who are engaged in evangelism, that's quite sobering and challenging, but we need to take that into account. So now, finally, the two halves of Lewis's life, remember those two halves, his imagination, which loves myth and poetry, and his reason, which demanded truth, but couldn't find meaning. Suddenly, those two things come together in the strangest and most unlikely place, the Christian faith that he had walked away from. And that's why his first biography is called The Pilgrim's Regress, based on Pilgrim's Progress. I don't recommend trying to read it because all sorts of allegorical references to philosophies and cultural currents that were around in Lewis's time that mean nothing to us. If you are determined, there is an annotated version that explains all these things brilliantly uh, in the footnotes, but it's not his most popular book and for, uh, for good reason. So the pilgrim has come out from the Christian faith, left it behind, and after a long journey has found his way back. It's rather like T.S. Eliot writes, we shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Is that good? Almost immediately, Lewis begins to integrate his faith 
into his writing. These are just some of them, but from now until his death in 1963, he writes at least one book every year. The Narnia books don't start appearing until 1950. Things you can do with PowerPoint, it's such fun. And there are the seven from 1950 to 1956. I might have come across them when I was a child, but somehow they didn't make their way till North Wales while I was still a child. And I never read these until I was 30, but it's never too late to have a, a happy childhood. Now, what exactly is he doing in the Narnia stories? Some people refer to the Narnia stories as an allegory, because at least in some stories, there are obvious allegorical elements. But when a class of school children in the USA write to ask him about his, quote, allegory, he actually says this is the wrong word. You are mistaken when you think that everything in the books represents something in this world. Things do that in the Pilgrim's Progress, and one might say in the Pilgrim's Regress, but I'm not writing in that way. So what kind of stories are these? Lewis made up a word to describe what he's doing. He calls it a supposal. He says, I'm not exactly representing the real Christian story in symbols. I'm more saying, suppose, there's the word, suppose there were a world like Narnia and it needed rescuing and the son of God or the great emperor oversee went to redeem it as he came to redeem ours, what might it in that world all have been like? And I think you can argue that he applies the same uh, principle of a supposal to uh, the, um, the space trilogy uh, as well. So uh, remember that for Lewis, in order for him to discover the reality at the heart of Christian faith, it was almost though he had to go away from Christianity as the Pilgrim's Regress to describe, describes. He finds spiritual reality elsewhere in his experiences of joy and in mythology. And then the word he uses in Surprised by Joy is that those things become a signpost actually pointing him to the reality that they represent. And what he discovers when he comes back to Christian faith is that in one sense it's the same and yet it's different. And the faith he finds as an adult brings meaning and stability and laughter and friendship and this integration of the intellect and the imagination that he struggled with uh, for so long. It's not that the stories of Jesus had changed, obviously, it was his understanding of them had changed because of the journey that he's been on. So what he's doing in Narnia, I believe, is um, trying to help us, uh, trying, trying himself to find a way to tell the old stories in a way that help other people to have the same experience that he does of winning their hearts in a different world, a different spiritual reality, and then directing them back to the place that is the source of those stories. It's interesting, you may remember in The Hobbit, um, Bilbo has his own title for the story that becomes The Hobbit, and that is There and Back Again. And there again is that, that idea of a journey taking you to a new place, but then bringing you back to where you started uh, with a new reality. So this is how Lewis describes what he's trying to do in the Narnia stories. Supposing, as suppose again, that by casting all these things into an imaginary world, all these things meaning Christian beliefs, stripping them of their stained glass and Sunday school associations, one could make them for the first time appear in their real potency. Could one thus steal past those watchful dragons? I thought one could. Incidentally, it was only tonight I thought, mm, it's actually a little ironical to have a stained glass window of the Narnia stories, but we don't need to dwell on that. So he wants to steal past the watchful dragons with his stories. What are they? They are the instincts that guard us and many people 
against anything that sounds too religious. But Lewis knows that when we defend ourselves against the religious, although that can be damaging, we are also protecting ourselves, defending ourselves against the Christ who is at the heart of Christian religion and who actually gives life. So he's trying to create stories that will steal past the dragons by creating stories that don't give off that musty churchy smell, but create this real potency that he has found. And hence Narnia. So as the poet Emily Dickinson says, tell all the truth, but some of you know what she says next, tell it slant. And in Narnia, that's what he's doing. He's trying to tell the truth of Christianity, but to tell it slant in order that we can see it more clearly. So instead of talking theory, let me give you a case study, our friend Edmonton. Um, here's an example of Lewis trying to steal past the watchful dragons. And in this case, I think he's trying to take two central Christian doctrines, that's what they are, sin and redemption, and take them out of their stained glass windows or their systematic theology books and help them get some emotional traction in our imagination and hence in our lives. So let's start here. What exactly is Edmund's problem? There's a clue in his first meeting with the White Witch. She says, I want a nice boy whom I could bring up as a prince and who would be king of Narnia when I am gone. While he was prince, he would wear a gold crown and eat Turkish delight all day long. And you are much the cleverest and handsomest young man I've ever met. Well, there are two kinds of pride. There's the innocent pride that takes pleasure in being the person God has made you to be. But then there's the negative kind of pride, the essence of which, says Lewis, is comparing ourselves to others. So the witch doesn't just say Edmund is clever and handsome, which might be okay if questionable, but actually the cleverest and the handsomest. In other words, tempting him to compare himself with other people. And one of the results of Edmund's pride as we've probably experienced in our own lives, is that it messes up relationships with other people. So he says, it's, Lewis tells us, for instance, Edmund kept on thinking that the other children were taking no notice of him, trying to give him the cold shoulder. They weren't, but he imagined it. And of course, if you think you're superior to other people, and for some reason people don't treat you that way, you're going to be upset, right? But of course, the deeper problem with Edmund's pride is that it puts him out of step with Aslan. Do you remember the beautiful scene where the beaver tells them Aslan is on the move? And they react differently, do you remember? Even though they know nothing about Aslan. At the name of Aslan, each one of them felt something jump in its inside. Edmund felt a sensation of mysterious horror. Peter suddenly felt brave and adventurous. Susan felt as if some delicious smell or some delightful strain of music had just floated up to her. And Lucy got the feeling you have when you wake up in the morning and realize that it's the beginning of the holidays or the beginning of summer. Yeah, some of us have that feeling right now. But Edmund's is a feeling of horror, do you remember? Why do they react those different ways? Lewis would say all of us are moving either closer to Aslan or moving away from Aslan, and that every choice we make, whether we're conscious of it being an ethical choice or a spiritual choice, is going to bring us closer or takes us further away. George MacDonald summarizes it in The Great Divorce. There are only two kinds of people in the end, those who say to God, thy will be done and those to whom God says, thy will be done, because they have insisted on having their own way, their own will. And up to this point, Esmond has basically been saying, my will be done. I want to do what I want to do. I want to be special. I want to be richer and handsomer than anyone else. And so even though he's never heard of Aslan, in fact, this has been leading him away from the reality of Aslan. So when he hears the name, he doesn't like it. He doesn't want to know more. 
because somehow he knows intuitively that Aslan is the rightful king and not him. And in fact, his pride means that he is out of step with Aslan's plan. In fact, his pride is pitting him against Aslan's plan for Narnia. So Lewis is trying to move us beyond what I suppose in the popular imagination is, is our understanding of sin, that it is physical, simple doing of bad things like eating too much Turkish delight. I've always felt slightly virtuous that I really don't like Turkish delight, but I guess that's just a symbol, right? Um, Rather, sin, Lewis would say, is choosing to live independently of God rather than in relationship with God. So when Edmund hears the name of Aslan, it challenges his independence and his pride. The children are drawn to him because they have not made that choice to live uh, independently in quite that way. And we can say also that sin is choosing to be less than God designed us to be. And we'll see by the end of the story more of what, it, what Aslan does intend for Edmund to be and how pride has twisted and warped his personality. But of course, Aslan has not finished with him yet. So after Aslan has died to pay the price for Edmund's pride and then been resurrected, Edmund still has to face Aslan. And something happens. Here's how that meeting is described. As soon as they had breakfasted, they all went out, and there they saw Aslan and Edmund walking together in the dewy grass. There is no need to tell you, and no one ever heard what Aslan was saying, but it was a conversation Edmund never forgot. We can guess, more or less, presumably something along the lines of, Edmund, you see what happens when you try and pretend that you are superior to everybody else? You've seen where that got you. I made you. I know what you're capable of becoming, but you will need to give up your pride and follow me in order to discover it. So there's one more piece to the conversion of Edmund, if I can call it that, uh, that makes this clear. And it comes at the end of the battle with the witch's forces, where we're told Lucy found Edmund standing on his feet not only healed of his wounds, but looking better than she had seen him look, oh, for ages. He had become his real old self again and could look you in the face. It's not something. And there on the field of battle, Aslan made him a knight. What I think is beautiful about this is the change Aslan makes doesn't make Edmund weird or religious or holier than thou. Now he is working with Aslan in the work of setting all Narnia free. And what effect does it have on him? It makes him himself the real Edmund that Aslan always intended for him to be. So what's Lewis up to? As with the word sin, he's trying to pry the word redemption free from its religious and churchy connotations and make it intelligible and attractive. He wants us to see it's not a mystical experience for religious people. It's not a matter of trying to be a nicer person, but rather it is allowing your creator to shape you into the real self you were always meant to be. And by putting what is, you know, in other contexts, pretty heavy doctrinal teaching, goodness, sin and redemption, it doesn't get heavier than that. But putting into a story about someone we can identify with, Edmund, by the end, he makes us feel, oh, that's wonderful. Edmund has become himself again. And it, teach, it touches our imagination and our emotions. But so far, we're still stuck in Narnia. We may have had these revelations through the story, but what then? How do we get back from Narnia to our world? What's next? Well, Lewis is a subtle evangelist, and he's not going to hit us over the head with it. He does want us, though, to complete the journey and make the transition back from Narnia to our world. 
So what he does, and again, this is such good evangelism, he gives us clues that people can follow if they want. And there are two places in particular where he comes close to giving away this strategy, and both are in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. I just want to talk about the second. And it's in the beautiful scene at the end of the Dawn Treader, uh, when the children are about to return to their own world, and Lucy weeps because she thinks they will never see Aslan again. And Aslan says, but you shall meet me, dear one. Are, are you there too, sir? said Edmund. I am, said Aslan, but there I have another name. You must learn to know me by that name. That was the very reason you were brought into Narnia, that by knowing me here for a little, you know, may know me better there. And Lewis the Evangelist is putting a grain of sand into the oyster of the reader's mind. What, what does it mean that? Aslan has a different name in our world. Does he mean it? How can we possibly know the fictional Aslan in our own world? But Lewis is smart enough not to tell us. He wants us to think about it, worry about it, keep our eyes and ears open, and hopefully to figure it out. And above all, he is hoping that our encounter with, Jesus, with Aslan will drive us back to the Jesus of the New Testament with new eyes. The challenge of the Narnia stories, whether we are Christians or not, is to let the watchful dragon sleep while we hear afresh or for the first time the good news of Jesus with new ears and with fresh imagination. And that as always in the Narnia stories and in the Christian life is not the end, but the end of the beginning.